Father, I thank you so much for the blessing, the encouragement, the hope that your word gives us. I thank you especially for the book of Ephesians. It gives a sense of security. It gives to us the freedom to claim what we have in Christ. In light of the admonitions, I pray, Father, that you would help us today to be encouraged, blessed, and strengthened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn, please, to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to highlight four or five things that I talked about last week, and then we're going to go on through the book. Notice, if you will, looking at your outlines, there are two key expressions to the book. Notice, if you will, please, Ephesians 1 and verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And then notice, if you would, those last words of verse number uh, 3. In the heavenly places. Drop down, if you will, to Ephesians 1, verse 20, and notice again the same important words. Paul tells us in verse number 20 of the work that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Come to chapter 2, verse 6. Again, he has seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And finally, chapter 3. You come to chapter 3 and notice, if you will, he tells us of the church that God designed the church so that through the church, verse 10, Ephesians 3.10, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, which is an expression for the angelic realm. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 do not mention heavenly places because chapter 4 and chapter 5 actually are dealing with our earthly walk. And I'll bring that out today in the outline. But you come to chapter 6. The book ends with this particular section. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 regarding our responsibility in this present darkness we wage a spiritual warfare against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So you begin and you end with heavenly places. In between you have an earthly walk and we'll talk about that. Then notice, if you will, secondly in your outlines, Ephesians chapter number 1. Notice, if you will, please, verse number 7. The second key expression is our riches that we have in Christ. Ephesians 1, <clears throat> the Bible says in Ephesians 1, Notice, if you will, verse 7, in him, for reference to Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Drop down, if you would, please, to Ephesians 1, and notice verse 18. Just before the end of the verse, you have the riches of his glorious inheritance. Chapter 2, notice, if you will, a repetition of the verse 8, uh, verse 7, pardon me, the riches of his grace. And then drop down, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter 3. And notice, if you would, please, the Bible says in Ephesians 3 and verse number uh, 8, to me, who am the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I don't know if you know Warren Wiersbe, but Warren Wiersbe outlines the book of Ephesians with two key words. 
Those two key words are Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, if you want to write this down. It is our wealth in Christ. This is not in the outlines, but you can add it. And then Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, our walk. In other words, you have what God has done for us, what God has done in us, and then how it's to work its way out. Now, looking at the outline that is in front of you, I mentioned last week as we close, there are four key positions for the Christian. Ephesians 2, verse number 5. Notice, if you will, please. <clears throat> the Bible says in Ephesians 2, and verse number 5, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, Christ made us sit together, God made us sit together in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and notice here's the key first position the Bible puts us in and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ so Ephesians 2 and verse 6 we sit notice if you will please Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10 lays the groundwork for two entire chapters Ephesians 2, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should, notice the word, walk. Now, that is developed if you come over to chapter 4. Chapters 4 and 5, both of them the key word. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 1, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord or for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling so sit walk then notice if you would please verse number 14 of chapter 3 you have a third position I'm sorry this is I stated it orderly in your notes in your notes, it is sit, 2-5. It is kneel, 1-15 and 3-14. Because there are two prayers, but notice if you will. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every, pardon me, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he would grant you to be strengthened. So you have sit, you have kneel, you have walk, Ephesians 4.1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy. And then finally in Ephesians chapter 6. Notice if you will please, the Bible says Ephesians 6, beginning in verse number 10. <clears throat> finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. But on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Notice Ephesians 6, 11. So we sit, we kneel, we walk, we stand. Now, last general, giving you the overview, and I'm going to go into some detail then. In your notes, if you would, chapters four, uh, 1 and 2 of Ephesians, God's purpose in Christ. Notice, if you will, Ephesians 1, the Bible says in verse number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Chapters 1 and 2 focus on God's work in Christ for us. Then notice, if you will, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul moves from what he has done, God has done in us in Christ, placed us in Christ. Chapter 2, placed us in the church. Now, in chapter 3, he's going to develop God's purpose in the church. Pardon me. Notice, if you will, please, 
Let's begin reading in Ephesians chapter number 3. And I'm going to drop down to the middle of the chapter. Ephesians chapter 6, a uh, 3, and verse number 8. I'm sorry I'm having so much trouble with my eyes recently. Ephesians 3, verse 8. Paul says in verse number 8 to me, Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that, notice these words, through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the angelic and demonic rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And we'll develop this in a little bit. And then finally, notice if you will, Ephesians 4 through 6 deals with God's purpose in the same. Now, in chapters 4, 5, and 6, we have a number of responsibilities I'm going to develop those this morning. Let's come back in the outlines now and pick up with where we should have uh, come to for today. Ephesians chapter number one, you have three sets of blessings mentioned. Notice, if you will, please, Ephesians chapter one, you have first of all the blessings from God the Father. Verse three, chapter one, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And now here are the key verbs of what he did. Even as he, note the verb, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame or blameless before him. In love, having noticed secondly, chose predestined, predestined us for, and then notice the word, adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. So, three verbs. Let me talk about them. Chose, predestined, and then adoption. Those three words are in your text. It doesn't matter whether we like the word chose. It doesn't matter if we fully comprehend it. It's clearly a Bible word. Warren Wiersbe was correct when he made this statement 50 years ago. Explain election and you lose your mind. Explain it away and you lose your soul. You really cannot get around dealing with the fact that the Bible teaches us that in eternity past, God chose in Christ. So eternity past is chosen. The second word is the word predestined. Predetermined, God predestined, predetermined. It is never used that word of the unsaved. It is used five times in the Bible, and all five times it is about the Christian. God has guaranteed the end of the believer, predestined the end of the believer. And how does the believer end? In Ephesians chapter 1, the final step, which we call glorification, here Paul calls adoption. Adoption is actually a legal word. What is the point? In Greece, and you remember the New Testament was written in Greek. In Greece, if you adopted a child, and let's say I have four children and I adopt a fifth one. If I die by Greek law, my adopted child gets the same inheritance as my real child. So what adoption is dealing with is God is guaranteeing us all of the glories that he has prepared for his son. 
we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. It's the way that Paul states it in the book of Romans. Then, notice if you will, secondly, we have blessings that come to us from God the Son. Looking at your outlines, notice if you would please Ephesians chapter number 1 and notice if you will please in verse number 6 to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved, in Christ. And what do we have in Christ? Notice, if you will, key words. In Him we have, number one, redemption. Number two, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So, Redemption and forgiveness. What does the word redemption mean? The word redeem is very simply a definition of God purchased humanity back when Christ died. Let me illustrate this this way. I have children, and let's say you have children. I have no right to control your children because they're not mine. But if they become mine, then I have ownership. And what God did is God saw humanity under Satan. We're called the sons of this world, the sons of disobedience. And Jesus Christ literally paid to have humanity, a new humanity, to become His. Now, I could develop this, but if I develop it too much, it will be too much time here. So, if you would, notice the second thing, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Just for the record, turn over to Colossians chapter 2. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 2. And notice, if you will, in Colossians chapter 2, The Bible says, Colossians 2, and notice verse 13. Dealing with this same wonderful truth that Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says to the church at Colossae, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us and would you complete the verse? We're missing one word. Oh, yes. Us. Having forgiven us. That's the key word. Having forgiven us all. There are people that believe that when you're saved, your record is clean to that point, but then you have to keep the record clean. Yeah. Paul tells us that God, when I, He saved us, cleansed us of every sin we had committed, are committing, and will ever commit. Our standing with God never changes, no matter how much we obey or fail. So, we are secure. Notice, if you will, please, Ephesians chapter number 1, we have blessings from the Holy Spirit as well. This is God's purpose in Himself, in the Father, in the Son, and notice, if you will, in the Spirit. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse number 12, So we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory, in Him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed. Oh, pardon me, and believed in Him, you were, notice, what has the Holy Spirit done for us? The word is sealed with the Spirit of promise, who is the earnest or guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. So you have two key things the Holy Spirit does. Number one, He seals us. What does seals us mean? 
If you lived in medieval England, an official document from the king to anywhere in the kingdom would carry the seal of the king which simply declared his message and authoritatively communicated. Well, the Holy Spirit is the seal that we are children of God. It is not that we don't drink, smoke, or curse. As important as those are, those are not the key. Romans 8 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So it is the Holy Spirit himself who is the seal. And then notice, if you will, he is the guarantee. The word guarantee in the original is the word A-R-A-B-O-N, Arabon. If you went to Greece today, the Arabon is an engagement ring. What is an engagement ring? Communicate. An intentions. Promise. A promise? Let me ask you a question. Could I promise a young lady that I'm going to marry her and not give her a ring? So what does the ring communicate that my words don't? Outward. You're making an investment. It's a greater investment to confirm that this is real. And the Holy Spirit is the confirmation that God has sealed me for eternity. Come to Ephesians chapter 2. And notice, if you will, Ephesians 2, looking at the bottom of the page and your notes, God's purpose in the church. Now, there are several things here that I've got to just point out because if I don't, they'll distract me and therefore I'll distract you. So notice, if you would, just for the sake of clarifying. Number one, you have a description of the unsaved. Notice, if you will, please, Ephesians 2, verse 1, we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. Number two, we walked following the course of this world. Notice, if you will, thirdly, we followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, in the sons of disobedience. So, let me mention three things here. If when we were lost, we were dead, let me ask you a question. How much of the resurrection power did Lazarus contribute to Jesus raising him? None. Do you understand what the Bible just told you about the people that God saves? We were dead. As startling as it is, that's the reality. We are not the key. God's grace is the key. You see, the truth of the matter is, when you pick the Bible up, the Bible uses two images to communicate salvation. Think about this for a moment. When I talk about salvation, I speak of a spiritual resurrection. I was dead, but now I am alive. The second thing is this. I am born again. How much did you contribute to your birth? You see, the Bible is not saying that man doesn't have freedom to choose. That is not the issue. The issue is that man does not have the power to do what needs to be done. The power is God's power. And that's why the Bible describes us as dead. It describes us as, notice in verse number three, the last set of words, disobedient. Ephesians 2, 3, we were disobedient. And then notice, if you will, as dead sinners walking in disobedience to God, we are energized by Satan. Notice these words. In Ephesians 2 and verse number 2. We follow the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the sons of disobedience. 
That word translated at work in the original language is that word energo. What does that sound like to you? Energo. What English word is similar to energo? How about this word? Energy. Satan enables unsaved people to live disobedient. Isn't it amazing? A man can go out and party and drink all night long and go to work the next day and you ask the question, where does he get the strength to do that? Because when I go to church and sit for 45 minutes, I fall asleep. Satan energizes the lost to do what is wrong. So you have three hindrances to what God is doing. But then Paul gives us three important realities of what God does do and how he does it. The forces that are at work. So, under the amazing depths, we have at the bottom of page one, we're dead and we are disobedient and we are energized by Satan. But then notice, if you will, Ephesians 2 and verse number 5. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 and verse number 5 concerning God's work in us and for us. Let's begin reading actually in Ephesians 2 verse 4. Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God who is, and here are the forces that God uses to bring us to Christ. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love toward us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God never forces salvation on anyone. But God takes us, and if I may use the words of Jeremiah, God with everlasting cords of love draws us to Christ. Every one of us came to Christ because we realized God loved us. We were stunned, perhaps. When God saves us, notice, if you will, he raises us up. Verse number five continues. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. By the way, to make us alive together with Christ, how is Christ alive today? Physically and spiritually. He is that. Why, why do you say he's physically alive? Didn't they put him in a grave? Yeah, but then he resurrected. So he arose. Yeah. Salvation is a spiritual resurrection. We don't just make a decision. We don't just pray a prayer. God actually spiritually does something in us just like he did to raise Christ. We are raised with Christ. Notice, if you will, the text continues with these words. He raised us, verse 6, up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ. If you'll notice, please, the text tells us in verse 5, have been saved. Past tense. Raised. Past tense. Seated. Past tense. Why? Because God doesn't deal with me in light of what I am today or who I am today. God sees me in heaven and deals with me as though I already had the right to heaven God is not saying I'm on trial. That is over and done with when I was adopted in Christ. But what God is saying is because this is what I have planned for you, I love you too much to see you damned, and I love you too much to see you disobedient. I'm going to perfect you to be in that place. That's what Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6 are talking about. <clears throat> then drop down, if you will, please, to Ephesians chapter 2, and notice verse 11. 
Paul says, now remember, this is to Gentiles. This will be important. I'll develop it some, but I have a limited amount of time. Verse 11. <coughs> Pardon me. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Pause. What in the world does he mean? If you and I were to come to the temple in Jerusalem, no Jew could enter the Holy of Holies. The high priest entered once a year. And outside of that, in the holy place, the priest alone could enter. And beyond that, there was a court known as the court of the men that no woman could enter. And beyond that, a court for the women. Only Jewish women could go that far. And beyond that, there was a wall just like around the tabernacle and no Gentile could enter beyond that point. We were totally separated from the altar, totally separated from the Ark of the Covenant, totally, totally separated from fellowship with God. And that would be true if you think about it. That image is true, but here's what's also true. It's also true that because we are Gentiles, we didn't even know God didn't know sin, sacrifice, as revealed in Scripture. We were alienated, the Bible says. But then, do you remember when Christ died, something significant happened in the temple? The curtain was torn from top to bottom. Historians tell us that the curtain was four inches thick. Now, you can't take a four-inch thick curtain and just rip it. So it's obviously something mighty took place to open it up. The writer of Hebrews tells us that in Christ we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So what the Bible is telling us is, even though we were Gentiles, even though we were pagans, even though we didn't have the right religion, even though we couldn't enter into Judaism, God immediately opened the door for us to enter the presence of God in the work of Jesus Christ. So, he continues with this point. He describes us in verse number 10, Ephesians 2.10, with these words. Is that verse 10? I'm sorry, I'm in verse 12. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Stop. Commonwealth of Israel is the nation of Israel. We had no part in their prophetic hope. But worse yet, notice, if you will, please, he describes us as strangers to the covenants of promise. The Old Testament covenants were to Israel, not to the church. So all of those prophetic things were not ours. But more tragic, we were, he continues, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And the words have been brought near are literally the idea that is used of a man who has the responsibility of introducing every guest to the king. We have been introduced to the king. We've been ushered into the presence of the king. He continues with these words. For he himself is our peace, who has made both Jew and Gentile one before the throne of God, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man 
Would you stop, please, and note those words, because everything else in the book is about these words, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. What does it mean? If a Gentile comes to Christ today, he's a new creation in Christ Jesus. He's also in the church. If a Jew comes to Christ today, he doesn't come as a Jew. He comes just like a Gentile in Christ. The one new man is not a reference to Israel past, nor a reference to Israel future. It is a reference to the church. Take your Bible, hold your place here, and go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice, if you will, please, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, notice, if you will, please, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, what's the word? New. New what? Creation. Would you note that? We are a new creation, and we are in the new creation. Turn over to Galatians chapter 6. That term is used again. Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Pardon me. Notice, if you will, please, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes to the church at Galatia, and he reminds them of this same glorious truth that all believers today are in the church, the new creation. Verse 15 of Galatians 6. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So when we pick the Bible up and we look at prophecy, here's what you look at. Israel Old Testament, new creation, the church, and then Israel future. Because what happens after the rapture is the Old Testament picks back up because the church is removed out of the way. So we who are in the church have an amazing fellowship, Jew and Gentile, regardless of our background. And then notice, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 3, I've mentioned the heavenly purpose of the church. Uh, Galatians, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 3, and notice, if you would please, uh, let's begin reading in Ephesians chapter 3, and I'll start reading at verse number I'll start at verse number 8. <clears throat> to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. I am humbled that God would use me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden in the ages in God who created all things, pause. The church, according to the Apostle Paul, is God's creation for this age. And Paul tells us this, now listen carefully. Ephesians chapter three. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ our Lord. Pause. Let's ask some questions. The angel sinned in the book of Genesis, recorded also in the book of Revelation. A third of the angels fell. Was there salvation for the angels? No. Never possible. So angels know obedience and disobedience. And, obe and angels also know serving God and rebellion against God. But angels do not know what forgiveness and grace are about. So God uses the church 
to teach the angels that a sinner can experience God's grace and be transformed by God's grace so that unlike the rebellious angels, he is a holy person. In other words, God's design for the church was to show the angels the power of grace to change a life. This bothers me in the sense that quite often all that matters to some people is did you pray the prayer? Do you know the verses? And we've got all these little formulas and all these little uh, equations that we use. But God intended that the saved, redeemed <coughs> sinner puts the very angels of heaven in surprise at what grace can do. That was God's design. So when you pick the Bible up and you read this passage, you come to a realization God intended the angels to stand in awe of the kind of life that grace produces. I find it interesting that we don't talk much about the holiness that God planned, but the rest of this book is the life itself that causes the angels to be in surprise. So looking at your outlines, I'm not going to talk a lot about all of this, but I'm going to walk you through it. In Ephesians 4 and 5, the key word to these two chapters is walk. So let me just touch on some things, and I do want to spend a little bit of time on at least one of them. Very important. Verse 1 of chapter 4, looking at Roman numeral 3, God's purpose in the same. So the key word to these two chapters is walk. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That expression, walk worthy of the calling, is not walk like a minister. It is not walk like a woman. It is walk like a person who has been saved out of sin and now has the Spirit of God alive in you and is living for God. Notice, if you will, please, we're to walk in unity, Paul says. Now listen carefully. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. As a believer, Paul begins this chapter by telling us we are to walk in unity. Notice verse 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We don't cause the unity, we cause the disunity. We should strive to be united. And he gives us a number of things that this is about. It's not unity for the sake of unity. It is unity out of holiness. Two believers committed to the Lordship of Christ, living for the glory of God, walking in the Spirit, do not end up at war with one another. It doesn't happen. Here's a perfect illustration. I take a tuning fork and I tune this piano and I drive a hundred miles and I take the same tuning fork and I tune that piano. Those two pianos will be in tune with one another. They cannot be in tune with the same thing and not be in tune with each other. So when believers clash, either one is not walking in the spirit the other's not walking in the Spirit, or neither is walking in the Spirit. Walk in unity. Notice, if you will, secondly, Ephesians chapter number, now I've got to go back and catch where I am. I have left my notes so long ago, I don't even think they exist now. Uh, let's see here. We are to walk in ministry. Notice, if you will, God saves us and intends that every single one of us is serving the body of Christ, is helping to further the testimony of the gospel. Ephesians chapter number 4, notice if you will please, the Bible says in verse number 8, um, therefore it says, 
when he ascended on high at his ascension, Christ led a host of captives, that is the Old Testament saints, and he gave gifts to men. So we are to find whatever is our gift. And by the way, you don't find your gift by looking for it. No one has ever discovered what their spiritual gift was by saying, I want to know what my gift is. Well, the gift they, tests don't do it. I was going to say, why do they have those gift tests? I know. What usually happens is this. This is more what really happens. We find our passions and we start doing what we like to do and others see us and they say, oh, Jody enjoys people. Jody enjoys serving coffee. Jody, is your gift possibly either serving or mercy? Hospitality. It's in the serving gifts. In other words, the observers usually can pick it up more than the person who's seeking to find it. So secondly, we are to walk in uh, ministry. Thirdly, notice Ephesians 4, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. Notice that's a description of what makes a person lost. Not because they didn't pray the prayer. They don't have the life of God, the resurrection life, the born again, born from above life because of the ignorance that is in them. And as a result of that, they have the hardness of their hearts. They become callous and have given themselves to sensuality, to greed, to practice every kind of impurity. So thirdly, we are to walk in purity. Notice the end of Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, let's begin reading in Ephesians chapter 4 at verse number 28. Therefore, put away falsehood. Let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting communication uh, or talk come out of your mouth, but that which is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So you have walking in uh, humility and walking in charity. Notice Ephesians 5, verse 1. Paul says, walk in love. Drop down, if you will, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. And notice, if you will, Ephesians 5 and verse 8. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. What does that mean? The Bible tells us that God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. So very simply put, we're to walk in the Bible, walk in the truth. Then, if you will, here's where I want to take a little bit of time. Ephesians 5, verse 15 tells us we are to walk with the right set of priorities. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Do you realize that you just have a description of the unsaved and the saved? The unsaved walk unwise, the saved walk wise. Wise in what sense? Making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So walk, the old King James said, walk circumspectly, meaning walk cautiously in your use of time. 
A believer does not believe from the Scripture that wasting his life and wasting his time pleases God. A believer understands my life is a stewardship. My time, I'm accountable for it. And therefore, I want to make good use of it so that God is pleased by my use of it. But then you come to this passage, which is often misused and abused. Ephesians 5, verse 18. Finally, Paul says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. How many of you have used the word debauchery in the last month? the last year. Degeneracy. But be filled with the Spirit. Stop. Let me talk about this particular subject because I think it is so abused. I'm going to give you a couple of statements that over the years have summarized the key teaching. They are not teaching statements, but they are thinking statements for the right perspective. Being filled with the Spirit is not putting more gas in the car. It is putting the right driver behind the wheel. When a person is filled with the Spirit, it is not ecstasy and overflowing that we are concerned about. It is who is in charge. To be filled with the Spirit, pleidroma, literally means to be controlled. Let me illustrate. Why does Paul say, don't be drunk? I live with alcoholics. I know what an alcoholic is like. I know what it's like. My grandmother's brother lived with us. And I know how it would be when Uncle Frank would come in every single weekend. He was an alcoholic. <clears throat> he was a painter by profession. And he would come home and Friday nights he'd start with Jack Daniels and it would be Jack Daniels till Monday morning. He first of all, when he began to drink, <coughs> he'd be funny. And then after a while, he became punchy. Verbally abusive. And then he became a very angry man. And a side of him that nobody would see except then would come out. In other words, alcohol took control of the person. Be not drunk with wine wherein, as King James says, is excess. That word excess literally means prodigal. Think of the prodigal son. Why would Paul tie being drunk with wine and not filled with the Spirit and he calls it excess because the prodigal son went to the far country and wasted everything. And a person who lives in their flesh will waste time, they will waste money, they will waste relationships. They are without even realizing it, destroying, 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 destroying because they have not a sense of proper values. But when the Spirit of God takes control of our lives, all of a sudden our perspective changes. An eternal perspective on time, an eternal perspective on relationships, an eternal perspective on responsibilities, an eternal perspective on ministry. It totally and radically changes our perspective. And so Paul closes the book by dealing with the importance of the spirit control life and chapter 5, beginning at verse number 18, all the way to chapter 6. <coughs> and that should be verse 10, not 0, letter H under Roman numeral 3. The entire section is about relationships. A person who's walking in the Spirit wants healthy relationships because God. You see, go back to chapter 1. Let me point something out very important in chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. The Bible says, and let's begin reading at verse number um, 9. 
Paul says, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Notice these words, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. God in Christ is a uniter. Satan is a divider. And so when a person has a spiritual relationship, they want harmony with other people. Certain issues are not worth bringing up. Why, why make a fight over that? Why quibble over that? Why argue over that? Why set boundaries over that? So many times the arguments that people have are from our carnality. They are not from God. Paul says that a person who's spirit-filled is a person with grace in relationships. And then he closes with this important reality. Ephesians chapter 6, and notice if you will please, and I'll mention where the verbs are coming from in Roman numeral 4, and then make the point. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and you can read on with the description of the armor. But here's the point. <clears throat> A believer recognizes that even though I see people and I see human conflicts, behind all human conflicts, Satan is at work. There has never been a conflict from Adam and Eve all through human history that Satan did not engineer. Go clear back to Adam and Eve, and who suggested to Eve that she take the fruit of the tree? Satan. And then Adam listened to her, Satan engineered it, and he disobeyed, and they're both separated from God. And then their son would listen to Satan and killed his brother Abel. And all of human history is about Satan dividing. Because the truth of the matter is, God is a God of harmony. He's not a God of conflict. And if sin never entered the world, conflict would never have entered the world. And so we are to verse 10 of chapter 6, watch. Verse 13, we are to stand. And finally, notice, if you will, please, Paul ends this section. In Ephesians chapter 6, knowing it, notice if you will please, verse 18. Praying at all times with all prayer and supplication to the end, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And pause, and I want you to notice some key words. Listen to this. Verse 18, praying sometimes. Is that what your Bible says? What does your Bible say? Be persistent in your prayers. Pray at all times in the Spirit. And then notice, with all prayer and supplication. And then... Verse 18 continues with all perseverance for all the saints. We talk about a people who are intercessors. Intercessors recognize that my prayer life is not just about my life. The old fashioned old timers would call this warfare praying, recognizing that there is a battle and there's a scene over here that needs me to support. I close with this illustration. The nation of Israel is going to battle. 
Exodus chapter 18, the Amalekites have come against them. Moses says to Joshua, Joshua, you fight on the battlefield and I'll go to the top and raise my hands in prayer. Two men stood by him, Aaron and Hur, both of them raising his hands. Praying with all prayer and supplication for all the saints is undergirding the work of God and others on our knees. Let's bow our heads in prayer as we close today. <clears throat> Father, we come to you today and we thank you for your word and for the blessing that it is, for the encouragement, for the instruction. At the same time, Father, our spirits are grieved by our failure and the failure that we see around us. We know that you are robbed of glory when the church does not fulfill her purpose. You are robbed of glory when Satan works to divide. We realize that when believers live in sin and disobedience and lack of holiness, you are robbed. And so I pray that you would help us to be faithful to you and to recognize that others who are struggling need our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.